you can't just go in there and, and trap them or shoot them. Um, the forest is very dense. They are extremely smart. So the rancher's asking for all the help he can get to try to, uh, you know, put a stop to this, this killing. <laughs> Thank you for coming, sir. I appreciate you making the trip. You bet. It's always fun. Um, so, look, you're the proprietor of Gem State Kennel, yeah? Mm -hmm. Awesome. You also happen to be a certified wolf hunter, a coyote hunter, avid fishing game person, and a badass dog trainer, which, which is how I met you. But as of late, I've become really interested in the wildlife management, right? The management of predators in Idaho. It's a, it's a hot subject, especially wolves right now being reintroduced about 30 years ago. And then the impact that we're seeing over the last three decades of, of what's going on. You have been hunting these animals for some time, not specifically wolves, but you do hunt wolves, but coyotes as well. And they're, they're another uh, type of, uh, you know, obviously canine predator. Talk me through this. Like, how did you get into hunting dogs essentially with dogs? Absolutely. Um, so pull, pull this guy just a little bit closer. The people want to hear from you, Seth. I was uh, born and raised here in this area in Idaho, and there's just unlimited outdoor opportunity, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, you name it. Um, my family, I didn't grow up hunting. Uh, I had some extended family that did a little bit and some, uh, as I was uh, elementary school and middle school, some of my friends were, their families were big into it. And I've always been in just very passionate about animals. You know, as a, as a young kid, uh, I was homeschooled and read lots of books, would go to the library every other day. And I would just take, you know, from, from animal encyclopedias to uh, old, old school hunting books that you'd find in the library and just read and read and read. Um, and somewhere along the line, I became very interested in uh, predators. I remember probably about sixth grade, I bought a a book from Barnes Know about predator hunting, bought some hand calls, taught myself how to hand call long before I'd ever even really seen a coyote. I could operate a hand call pretty well. Um, my family always had dogs growing up, border collies, and they're super, super intelligent dogs. You can teach a border collie to do just about anything. And I ended up teaching our family dogs to hunt with me, uh, retrieving birds and just stuff I could do on my own, riding my bike away from my house. Then I got my driver's license. Um, shortly after that, I got my first hunting dog, which was like a, a lab cross, just a, a free parking lot puppy type of deal. But that dog ended up being an amazing dog and really, really grew my passion for uh, hunting with dogs. You know, up until then, I loved hunting. But as soon as I started spending time raising and training this dog to waterfowl hunt with me, uh, that was my thing. Um, and I've never looked back from, from that point and just been dogs, dogs, dogs. Uh, as I got I, more, I, I have to say, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm very excited about training up. I got a, you helped me get a, uh, uh, a lab golden retriever mix. That's mm. this fantastic dog. And I'm really excited to go hunting with this dog. If my wife doesn't kill the dog first <laughs> for destroying our house, yeah, like you'll get the that. dog is yeah. so beautiful and yeah. so fun and, and so crazy. It's and like all mm. that, all that, uh, energy and you know, drive that she has will translate over yeah. to be uh, useful in a right. hunting sense. And it becomes, that's the best part of the hunt for me is watching my dogs perform. Uh, you know, that's the, the highlight. My success isn't really based on, you know, uh, what I harvest, but rather what my, my dogs do in that situation. Um, it's like the story help. of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Very energetic. <laughs> yes. If only we could focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Me right. too. Um, and so, I got into uh, calling coyotes out here in, in the West is pretty popular, common thing. Um, we have tons of public land here and there's coyotes living on every square inch of it. Um, as I got into, like, I think it was YouTube, the first, the first time I've ever seen what I call and what's known as decoy dogging, which is using a dog to aid in calling coyotes. You can capitalize on the coyotes, uh, territorial side of things that where they'll be, you know, aggressive to other coyotes to keep them out of the area. They will do the same thing to a dog during certain times of the year. And so you can go out and sit down and play uh, either on a hand call, or I often use uh, a, an electronic speaker with, with coyote sounds recorded onto it. Mm -hmm. So I can sound like some, some coyotes over here in this, in this corner of the resident coyotes territory, they show up, they see my dog. They want to run my dog 
off of their their zone and they become so focused on the dog that they lose their uh their their caution and a coyote is an incredibly smart cautious animal so if without the dog uh, it, one of the most challenging parts is getting your, your shot off before the coyote sees you and just runs off. Um, when you have the dog there, uh, the coolest thing for me is to just kind of sit back and watch this back and forth game of tag between the dog and the, the coyote. And you can see, you know, I can sit there for sometimes 30 minutes and watch this coyote uh, do things that you would never see it do without the dog there. Uh, just being very vocal, posturing, snarling and growling they're not actually very tough so they don't really want to engage with the dog but they want to try to scare him <laughs> and so you get this this back and forth game where the dog chases the coyote the coyote turns and runs the dog stops and comes back and the coyote's right here on his butt nipping at him and sometimes they'll come you know within feet of me and still not be scared away so MTU Studios is the proud producer for the Ada County Sheriff Podcast, the Idaho Wildlife Federation Podcast, the State Representative Ted Hill Podcast, the Idaho State PTA Podcast, and many more. If you or your organization is thinking about starting a podcast, MTU Studios would love to help. Just check out mtustudios.com. Uh, That's wild. So it's like an insane dog of canine pickle. Yeah, exactly. And so that has been uh, over like the last 10 years more and more has become my biggest passion with outdoors and hunting is, is hunting coyotes with dogs in this, in this manner. Um, I've also done a, quite a bit of wolf hunting, which we'll, we'll get into. Um, you know, I've, I've, the dogs have aided me in that and in certain ways, which maybe we'll touch on. Um, but overall, uh, that is the, the gist of, of what I do using these, these dogs to, to hunt the coyotes. Now, when you're dealing with like coyotes, when I was living back in California, which is not a, I'm not saying I have a hunting reference there, but coyotes were very, very, con uh, they would kill um, domesticated dogs all the time. And they were incredibly clever, pretty much exactly what you do. Anybody walking with their dog, th this was a very common occurrence. Um, somebody walks with their dog on an empty trail or an empty field or something. And they're like, oh, well, there are no other dogs around. I'll just take my dog off the leash. And the coyote will do exactly what you were talking about, which is come out and antagonize the dog that's off leash. The person's freaking out. They're like, oh my God, that's a coyote. And its dog will chase the coyote and the coyote will go, go, go. And then when the dog stops, the coyote will turn around and come back and nip and go, mm -hmm. go, go. And pretty soon the, the domesticated animal has been drawn away from its over far away, mm -hmm. at which point like the other coyotes jump on him. Yep, and yep. it's this total ambush thing. It's like, how did they figure that out? Like they are incredibly intelligent yeah. two, animals. Two things, one being, uh, the coyotes down in California obviously aren't very pressured as far as hunted. Right. Uh, in coyotes yeah, they don't so get the shit down there. They're like, what, man? Yeah, Come on they're now. so adaptable either. Like in, in, in one generation, the coyotes can learn, okay, you know, we're, we're pretty safe here. We can get away with jumping in the backyard and snagging a cat over right. and over again. Nothing bad's going to happen. And then they teach that to their young, their young pups. And then you have this generationally coyotes will learn behavior and it will, will, perpetuate until something changes and they say, okay, we're, we're not getting away with this anymore. Um, the other th part of that, where you talked about, like you get, uh, somebody with their dog walking down the trail, um, when it, in, in it is very similar to what I'm dealing with. The difference is, is that the, their dogs are like, Oh, cause other dog, I'm going to chase it and it chases me, chase it, chases me. Right. Then they get down out of sight, down the brush and the coyote will then, uh, will then start really putting the pressure on this dog, trying to feel him out, seeing if he's going to be dinner or if he's, he's too tough. Uh, when my hunting dogs are out there, you know, sometimes, uh, I'll sit down, uh, I will play some coyote howls off in the distance over the ridge. Some coyotes will answer back. My dogs hear that and shoo, they run across the valley up over the ridge and they go to those coyotes. When they meet up with them, the coyotes are like, Oh, look at this dog. And usually there's a couple coyotes and they all kind of come in and start nipping at the dog and they're trying to feel him out. I've found that if the dog is the, is, has the breeding and the experience, my dogs never think that they, they're always winning. You know, they've, they've, uh, they have this mindset where I can't be beat. I don't care how many coyotes are on me. I, I got this. And so the coyotes, they have a very strong sense of self-preservation and they aren't going to get themselves hurt because that would mean that they probably would starve to death. Uh, and so as they come in on this dog, start pressuring him, nipping at him, if the dog doesn't show any signs of weakness and he keeps fighting and nipping back and moving, 
you know, the chaos will kind of give him a little bit of a bubble and he can then turn around and come back to me leading those coyotes in on a string. Because when the second that your dog turns around, the coyotes are going to follow. Yep. And when, but if the dog says, oh man, uh, I'm in a bad spot here, starts to cower, yelp, try to get away. That's when the coyotes say, okay, we got him. And we'll then team up and potentially kill that dog. So if it's a non-hunting dog, chances are it's going to get overwhelmed and not want to be fighting a pack of coyotes. And that's where the coyotes will, will get that dog um, versus a dog who, like one of mine, I'm never concerned. You know, we might hear a big scrimmage over the hill and my friends who aren't, who've never done it before say, oh, like, are we going to go save the dog? Like, nope, he's, he's got it. Just watch. And every time he comes leading the, the coyotes over the hill and, and is able to, you know, fight them off. So it's unbelievable. It's, what, like what kind of dogs are you doing this with? How uh, big are there's, they? uh, I'm looking for like a, a 40 to 45 pound dog about coyote sized that just has this, uh, desire to run out there and kind of boxing match with the coyotes and have fun with that. Um, there's the dogs aren't, uh, they're, they're smart enough to understand the, the game and know that we're, I'm going to shoot the coyote if they bring it close enough, but they're really just out there to have a good time and run around and, and mess with these coyotes. So a lot of different dogs can, can do it. Uh, if you're a coyote hunter, I tell people, you know, any dog, uh, I, I call it, I call it a coyote calling stand. A stand is where I go out and sit down and for 15 to 30 minutes and play my sounds, hoping to, to pull in coyotes. So any dog on a coyote stand is going to benefit because when that coyote comes in and your dog's kind of moving around you, walking around, sniffing, even if he doesn't see the coyote, the coyote sees something to go with what he's hearing. And he will then, uh, maybe he'll come in on the dog. Maybe he'll just sit there and watch for a while, but then you have all the time in the world to kind of make a good, a good clean shot. There's no, you're not rushed. Um, but I'm looking for dogs that uh, have the drive that even if they just hear them howling the distance, they were, are willing to, to go out there to them. Um, I call it going, going to a coyote. So any dog that will go to a coyote that I call in has potential to be a decoy dog. Um, I have found that, uh, for me, um, I've bred, uh, hunting. So everyone's kind of familiar with what a terrier is. Um, there's a lot of different types of terrier ranging from uh, an American pit bull terrier to, uh, a jag terrier, uh, I say Jag Terrier. The proper name is Yak Terrier. It's a German breed. Uh, Germans are interesting folks, and they've created some very interesting hunting breeds. Some very uh, spe- some dogs that are very specifically suited to a task. And the the Jag Terrier is bred to go into a, a hole and uh, find a fox or a badger and kind of bay it, pin it up in the, in that burrow. And then somebody comes, then all the guys get together with shovels and dig down to that animal, uh, and help the dog. So those dogs are obviously small. Um, and so I'm crossing, uh, these, these, the small, this little savage terrier to something like, a, a hound or, uh, if anyone's familiar with like a black mouth cur, an old yeller dog, um, maybe a, a border collie or a herding dog and try to get the size up and not lose any of that, that prey drive. Um, but also get, uh, they, they need to have a good nose. They got to be able to track. They got to be able to, to smell stuff really well. Um, and they have to have, uh, a lot of bravery. So, you know, a, a dog that's willing to, to herd cows and push a cow, a dog that's willing to go down in a hole and, and fight a fox, um, is definitely going to be the type of dog that will probably, uh, enjoy going out and, and, uh, interacting with these coyotes and, and bringing them back to me. So all my dogs are complete mutts, but I can tell you back to their great, great grandparents, what they are. Um, God, and then that, I, I have to say like, that is the wildest shit. Like conceptualizing going down into some, it's, it's like a scene out of Forrest Gump. They're like getting the foxhole and he just dude, it, flashlight and gun goes crazy. straight in. Yeah. It's amazing what yeah. humans can, can do with selective breeding and, and what working dogs are capable of, you know, whether it's a, a dog, a bird dog that, uh, whether he's a pointing dog, that's something that is uh, amazing to, to create a dog that instead of the instinctual uh, grab of right. their prey, freeze up and, and hold that point for an indefinite amount of time until you show up and, and shoot the bird for them. A hound dog that has this in, innate desire to put his nose to the ground and follow a scent for miles and miles and miles 
And then when he gets to it, stand there and bark until you show up. Um, so I saw he, I saw a very cool video recently of uh, dachshunds, mm -hmm. like the little little wiener dog, long haired mm -hmm. dachshunds, and it was a hunting video and. They had like, it was like four or five of them. They're like, oh my God, they're so cute. And there's this little hole and they're kind of sniffing around. And one of them just dove head first into this hole. And you could hear the guy being like, get it, get it. And you're like, what the hell is going on? It's obviously like a, a cell phone video. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you see this dog's ass backing out and he's like struggling. You're like, what's happening? And you realize he pops out. He went in and dragged a dead rabbit out mm -hmm. of this thing that was like twice his size. Yep. And he's this long wiener dog that's perfectly mm -hmm. suited to go into this tiny little yep. cave yep. into the darkness, find yeah. this thing and drag it out. And they're like, good job, buddy. He's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like yes. Yeah. And yeah. You look at that. You're like, oh, that's why. That's, that's why they're wiener like dogs. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's why they look like that is because yeah. they're bred to go into to go to ground right. is what you call it. So uh, yeah, I've just, I've tried a lot of different dogs and I've settled on, uh, these, these specific ones that do really good for me. And now I'm kind of breeding off of them and getting as good or better in their, their pups. And I'm always going to have some, some coyote dogs on me now. That's awesome. Now, when you guys, I've, I've seen several videos, one of you, you having the dog baiting and decoying. Um, I've also seen uh, videos where your dogs actually eat the coyotes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, like, is that dangerous to them as far as like pathogens or is it essentially yeah, like, good, look, man, good dogs question. eat dogs. Uh, right? Like coyotes are actually a very clean animal. Uh, every, a lot of people have heard of mange. Mange is actually yeah. something that the government introduced to coyotes in the, I don't know, give or take 10 years, the fifties is a means of hopefully wiping them out and didn't wipe them out. It's just this terrible disease that can affect coyotes now. Um, and they will carry it in places where they have a really high population. But other than that, uh, Foxes, um, a lot of smaller animals will be very heavy with fleas in Idaho here in the West. Um, but for some reason or another, our coyotes are uh, hardly ever have fleas. So I don't have, you know, fleas are the worst thing I might have to worry about. And we don't, uh, we don't really have that. Rabies is very uh, rare out West. I mean, I still rabies vaccinate all my dogs, but that's not really a concern. Um, and so, yeah, there's not much uh, transferring from the, from the coyotes to the dogs. Um, I do have, I've been doing this for, oh, almost 10 years, uh, hunting coyotes with dogs. Um, it, it, it or I do it enough on a day-to-day -day basis that I've gotten pretty decently good at it. Um, I've actually got to the point where I've shot enough coyotes that that's not really, uh, the exciting challenge that it once was, um, and so I've tried to level it up a little bit. And I, in my mind, the, uh, the most pure form of this type of hunting would be that the dogs, uh, are, are strictly going to handle it start to finish. So I have my decoy dogs, their job is to go out and lure the coyotes in. And then I have greyhound type dogs they're called stag hounds, and they are bred specifically, um, here in the U S and uh, up in Canada, they've been around since Teddy Roosevelt and general Custer as a kid, I was reading books of, uh, handwritten notes of Teddy Roosevelt talking about horseback hunting these stag hounds for all the different predators in the West. Um, and so I'll sit there with my, my stag hounds and they'll sit in the bush with me. The dogs will go out when the coyotes are as close as I think they'll come. I'll let the stag hounds go and they'll try to run it down. The coyotes are so fast and so agile and know the lay of the land so well that it is a very very low percentage of success for these dogs even when they're in peak physical condition they're as, as good as it gets and those coyotes can still just walk them through the through the rocks and the brush um but that's cool for me because that low success keeps you keeps you at it and, and really drives me um and i feel like it's uh I, I root for the the coyote you know uh as a coyote hunter the more coyotes out there, the better, you know, we're going to talk about predator management, predator control. And I do do that. But when I'm not in an area that, uh, I'm working, um, I would almost rather the coyote get away. Uh, the dogs are going to try their best every time. I'm going to try to set them up and I'm going to try to make it happen. But, um, I'm almost, uh, surprised when it does all come together. And I like that because the coyote has a, the most sporting chance he could possibly have, uh, you know, from, uh, from picking out the scenario and leaving before he gets close enough to outrunning the dogs to, uh, out fighting the dogs. It's, uh, it definitely gives the coyote the, as much of a chance as, as possible and really makes me have to 
be at my absolute best, you know, feeding my dogs, exercising my dogs, hunting my dogs, uh, to get them to the point where they're capable of that. Um, in like the past couple of years, that's been my, my new thing that I've really been working towards perfecting. There's a, uh, I heard somebody talking about the integration of horses into human, human activities, right? Not, not like, oh, people from the West is like, no, no humans in early horses, days, yeah. right? Early, early days. And the idea is that you essentially make a hybrid animal. Right. Like you have something with the power and capacity of a horse, but with the cunning and intellect of a human and they, if effectively done, they kind of become this different animal hmm. that can then go and hunt buffalo and can go do, you know, whatever it might yep. be. Yep. And, the, and how you're talking about the dogs, it's like if you let all of your dogs go and just like, OK, you're free in the world, dogs, like the odds of the dogs setting all this up perfectly for themselves, probably even lower probability. But it. It's almost like the dogs in your mind or in your practice have become like this. You guys have become a hybrid unit where it's like you have the capacity to physically take the dog set up like you're calling the play. You're running everything. Mm -hmm. You're baiting it in. You're telling them when to go and you're functioning as this organism together. So you as an individual would have no chance of ever running down a coyote. Yeah. Right. But if you successfully merge yourself with trusting, well-trained mm -hmm. dogs, then you guys get become something else mm -hmm. without the use of additional, you know, technology. It's not yeah. without the, without the use of a long range rifle, without the use of these things. It's like, no, 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 just me and my dogs versus that wild fucking animal. Yeah, exactly. And like we might win, it might win, but like mm -hmm. we got a chance. Yeah. And it really takes, just like I said earlier with the, the pointing dog or the hound dog, this, uh, ex extremely specific job that they do. Uh, that's what it takes in, in my dogs. They, they have to come from dogs that for generation after generation were performing this job in order to have any chance at doing it. Uh, and it's really cool to, cause like, I'm like their, I'm their ride out there. You know, I, I call the coyote, but I'm not really directing. I don't direct them at all to do their job. The decoy dogs naturally, they figure out that they can't catch the coyote. And I take my young dogs out there and it's their first time. The coyote comes in, they try as hard as they can to run it down. And a lot of times they'll run it out of sight and the coyote will run off and they'll come back like, oh, well, that was fun. But after they do that a few times. Like, then they Dad, I'm sorry, like, I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't keep going, Dad. I tried. But then they, then they slow up and they stop and the coyote stops and they learn like, okay, if I play this cat and mouse game, the coyote's going to come here and, and stay with me. Um, then they start doing that naturally. I'm not, when they're, when they're older uh, and experienced, I have a GPS collar on them that can vibrate. Not only can I see exactly where they are, how far away they are, um, I can communicate with them a little bit. And if they're getting getting too far, I can give them a little vibration or a little beep, to remind them to, to turn and come back. Um, you know, with those with my stag hounds, you know, the training goes into teaching them to sit still next to me and not just bounce around and uh, sit there and look and see the coyote coming um, and sit there and wait. Because a lot of times I want that coyote to come and go and come and go and before I let them go. But when it comes to them doing their job of running out there and navigating the terrain and, and being good at running at that top speed to match the coyote, that's all them. Um, and so from the dog handler's perspective, you really learn to, to there's, a, there's a saying that's uh, popular among dog people, uh, a man's ego is a heavy burden for a dog to carry. You know, I'm like, all right, I got these badass dogs out here, you know, they can they can kill any coyote and I'm going to be disappointed if they don't. Well, that's going to be a terrible mindset. I have to say these dogs are, they're bred for it that, you know, I've prepared them, but they're still often not going to be successful and that's okay. And I'm going to have fun. Uh, you know, that's, I'm not going to connect, you know, how good of a time I have and how worthwhile this is to me in the success of, you know, catching the coyote. Um, it's all going to come from just being out there with my dogs. You know, I, I like to just sit there and look at my dogs. Like my, my stag hounds, they're like the racehorse of a dog. They're just an incredible looking animal. They're jacked. You know, it is just cool to sit there and be like, wow, I get to hang out and hunt with this specimen of a dog. Uh, and it likes me and it's working for me. Like this is just a cool experience all around, no matter what's going on. Um, and that is really kind of what my, my focus and what I try to, uh, keep my, my focus on as I'm out here, you know, taking care of these dogs and hunting these dogs. There's a, I mean, obviously you go back to Pavlov was with really, um, I mean, Pavlov was not a hunter, but like training, training animals. And that's a classic psychological example. But do you, like, what do you do in the way of encouragement? 
because you want to positively reinforce animal uh, the the success of a dog. Like, yes, you did it. Great job, right? Yep. But so much of what you're talking about probably ends in failure. But it, if the ego and burden of the dog is like, damn it, I'm going to come back empty handed. He's going to beat me with a belt. Yeah, yeah. Like, that no, sucks. I, I'm I'm the dog. Uh, like even when it comes to the decoy dogs, even if they. Uh, even if I don't shoot the coyote for them and they don't, their, their reward at the end is uh, getting to chew on it and be like, all right, we finally, we finally got it. Even if I don't do that, they still have so much like that little dog that wants to go into the hole. Like that's just a crazy thing for that dog to have that much mm -hmm. desire to, to do that. Um, that dog gets enjoyment out of just trying and just, and even if he's not successful, he's still going to come back the next time and enjoy you know, running the hills, chasing the coyotes, smelling the coyotes, and just trying, even if he doesn't have that success. So I don't have to uh, reward them specifically in any way, uh, as long as the dog is is bred right and, and has that desire. Um, I do try to be, you know, very when I'm when we're out there hunting, I'm very quiet and still and kind of boring to the dogs. So when I light up and go, oh, good job, guys! Like we got them, woohoo! Like you can just see their energy raise. And so, uh, you know, obviously in the right times when I, when I give them that praise and tell them good job really reaffirms for them what they already are doing and would probably do whether I praise them or not. Um, because again, the, the training, the, the training really that I would consider training comes into play with the handling with, uh, I park off the side of a busy highway and I walk up into the Hills and now I'm coming back to the highway and I say, he'll walk right next to me. And you know, my, my, these dogs who I just a minute ago said, run over the mountain and go crazy. And I'll see you when you get back. Now I say, all right, now walk right next to me. Like your lives depend on it. And I can have that consistency of, of both worlds. Um, you know, jumping in the back of the truck together and, you know, not getting grumpy with each other and, and all, all squeezing together. Like there's a lot of training involved where I have to give a lot of direction and a lot of praise. But when it comes to the, the actual hunting, um, they're very much self-sufficient. Yeah. Man, I'm I'm getting fired up just listening to you. I gotta be honest. I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking about what to say because I just want you to keep talking. Um, a question that I've also had is, y you you hunt a lot of predators. Do you eat any of the predators you hunt? Like, do you eat the coyotes ever? Um, I have eaten the coyotes just because I feel like it'd be weird not to to try it. Give it a shot. Um, I'm of the opinion that meat is meat. Uh, you can make anything tastes great if it's properly prepared. You, I mean, like other cultures, or something? <laughs> well, other, other cultures love dog meat. Uh, sure. I actually do, uh, some guiding and every year I have some, some Chinese guys come over and most of them don't actually eat dog, but in parts of their country or neighboring sure. countries, sure. very common. And, uh, like, they're like, all right, like, are we going to, we're going to take this home and, and eat it. Like they, they're just very, it doesn't cross their mind. Not, not that we wouldn't be eating these. And of course, uh, Americans and, you know, Western cultures like, Ooh, dog, coyote wolf that's that's gross <laughs> there is uh like wolves can carry some hardcore diseases that would make me not want to eat one sure coyotes not so much um but they're definitely not not that good uh, uh, uh <laughs> mountain lion they don't though, taste good mountain lion bobcat prepared right is amazing eating it's a very light uh mild flavored meat um and so there is uh you know, you can, there's some food value to them, uh, with coyotes historically, their fur is very valuable and has been used for clothing and crafts. Um, just a quick note on that. Uh, the pop, the price in the, of, of fur is always rising and falling depending on the species, depending on supply and demand. Um, they're historically like the eighties, nineties, uh, late eighties, early nineties, I believe, people were buying houses and trucks off of their winter trapping, uh, on coyotes, you know, coyotes were worth a hundred dollars a pelt back then, which was big money. Um, and so there was a lot of value in them there. Um, then and it kind of, they, they are a renewable, resource. very renewable. Yeah. Fur is the most renewable resource ever. It's the highest quality of clothing, but then you get uh, PETA on the scene <laughs> and as fur prices have kind of ri rose and fall based on the supply and demand, uh, then you have this, uh, this other factor of animal rights movements and they can go to a, a company and, and, you know, blast them on social media now. And 
they can get enough hate that they'll change their their products. So uh, coyote fur was pretty down. Um, and then all of a sudden of recent about, uh, 2017, 2018, all of a sudden it boomed Can, uh, Canada goose is a clothing company and they were trimming all their, uh, fur, trimming all their hoods with some fur lining. Um, if you look at the back of a coyote, they have this long, beautiful guard hair. Uh, and so like this, the six to eight inches on the back of that coyote were, uh, the valuable part where they take strips and line the coat. And so then all of a sudden coyotes were worth a hundred dollars again. Uh, coyotes are the the quality of their fur really fluctuates based on where they're at based on elevation uh based on the country they live in they the, like here in, in idaho we have kind of a grayish reddish coyote we have a lot of sagebrush a lot of rock they blend in perfectly to that terrain um out in uh northern and central montana uh north and south dakota they got this wide open prairie very snowy in the winter the coyotes are what you call pale more white to blend into that terrain um those coyotes are the most valuable uh, coyotes anywhere. Um, the, I have a good friend of mine. He's from the, the Montana, Canada border, call it the Montana high line. Those are the best coyotes in the world. Um, you know, uh, in 2018, one of those prime coyotes was worth 150, even $200. A coyote here, uh, was worth maybe mm, 80. Those are, they're worth that after the trapper has skinned them, uh, flush them, wash them, stretch them, dry them, and put in all this work, which is really an art form uh, of, of putting up the, the fur and making sure that it can be sold and stored long-term before it's tanned and turned into clothing. Um, PETA came in, started hammering the, the Canada Goose Company, and all of a sudden they said, all right, we're, we're done. We're going to not use any fur on our coats anymore. And because they were kind of an industry leader, the fashion and clothing, all the other companies said, all right, we aren't either. And then COVID hit in between that supply and demand issue and these companies not using coyote for anymore, it dropped. And so then coyotes became uh, essentially worthless. Like a coyote here takes so much time and effort to get the coyote, much less the hours and hours of time and skill it takes to put up the fur that, you know, no one can afford to, uh, to do that for a coyote who the end result is only going to be like 15 or 20 bucks. So that really affects the predator control aspect of things because when these coyotes are super valuable, the general public is motivated to go out and put effort into hunting them, harvesting them when they aren't worth anything, uh, that significantly drops. And so the coyote population will kind of, uh, be affected by that. So, well, yeah, naturally, I mean, people aren't putting the effort and if they're not motivated. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of other, uh, recreationally I've noticed, uh, you know, predator hunting, all hunting in in general seems to be kind of on an uptick. Um, social media, podcasts, TV, um, people that weren't into hunting are are now getting into it. Um, here in Idaho, coyotes are, you can hunt them year round. Um, predators in Western states, especially that are, uh, you know, ranching, is a big part of our, our state, especially cattle. So you're going to see, uh, you know, predator control being a big part of that. You look back on the East coast where farming and ranching are almost non-existent. You're starting to see things like, uh, uh, seasons on coyotes where they're going to shut down hunting on them in the spring and summer, only allow it in the fall and winter, not allow trapping. Um, and so there across the country, there's a big difference in that predator management, but Montana, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, they stay pretty, pretty wide open on the, the predator management. Um, and so that, that the coyotes are affected by the, by those fur prices that affects their, their value. Um, but they are still always going to be, uh, getting hunted. So that's kind of the, the, the big conversation with predator control is, you know, we're not necessarily eating them. They do have some, some value in their fur. Um, but a lot of the push, to allow, you know, open season on them is because we say the, the livestock producers and the wildlife need us on their side. Uh, uh, you know, we obviously are living in where people didn't used to live, like the, the deer and the elk, their, their homeland is, is shrinking. Uh, they, the argument is that we need humans to offset that and, you know, keep the predators in check so that everything else can, can stay consistent. Coyotes won. How long have you been hunting wolves? Um, about six years ago. Uh, so I started coyote hunting 
uh, professionally. Um, I got hired by a big ag corporation here to uh, manage a, a very big area for, for coyotes. Um, the, the ranching community is very tight knit. And so I have a lot of, uh, personal friends whose families are big ranchers. Um, you know, wolves, uh, as we'll talk about this, but over the last couple of years, Idaho has really opened up, uh, the management for wolves. Whereas even five, six years ago, like when I first started, um, you know, the seasons were very, uh, short compared to now, um, a lot of rules uh, on how you could hunt them. So the ranchers, when they had, uh, they were having a lot of issues with wolves, and they were seeking any any help they they could. And so one of my good friends, uh, him and his family have a, a, a big ranching operation. Uh, at that point, they had twenty five head twenty five hundred head of mother cows spread out on a couple different ranches, uh, and in one particular area. Um, this is this area and specifically you'll know is, uh, the, the McCall Cascade Donnelly yeah. Valley. Um, a lot of people there, a lot of recreation, um, both hunting and, you know, we got ski resorts there, everything you can, can think of. Um, but one of the, uh, worst places in the state where wolves were affecting, uh, ranchers to put it in perspective, you know, wolves have been prevalent in Idaho for say 15 years. So 10 years before that, uh, this was 2018 that I started. So, you know, 2008, 2010, these ranches started having these problems where, uh, up in the high mountains, that's where they summer cows. So the most ranchers will have, um, lower their, their home ranch will be, you know, down on some, some desert country where the winter's a little more mild, less snow where they can hay their cows through the winter. And then in the summer, these mountain, these mountain ranges get, uh, super lush feed. Great, great for the cows. Uh, and they'll move them up there for the spring and summer. And that's where the wolves live. Um, the cows will calve typically long before they get up to the mountains. So the calves are pretty decent size when they get there. Um, they get there, depending on the snow, end of April, beginning of May, and then they'll stay there through September. Uh, in this area from that point, even till now, uh, there is, about on average, say 50 head of livestock killed, uh, throughout that Valley, uh, in a summer, um, consistently every summer, uh, a couple of different wolf packs in different areas. There's kind of hot spots where, uh, they were especially problematic and my rancher friends are in one of those spots and then their neighbors as well. Um, the interesting thing, just to kind of give a, a sense of the situation, and like these ranchers perspectives, um, there, I, I don't want to say there's no uh, occasion, but 99% of these situations where the wolves kill livestock, whether it's a, a cow or a horse, they aren't eating the the animal at all. Um, up there in the mountains, the wolves are, are so efficient that they can kill whenever they want, eat whatever they want. Um, they're roaming through the woods, they come upon a herd of dumb cows, like, oh, it's uh, wolves are hunters, you know, as a, a hunter, um, any hunter that tells you they don't hunt for, for fun, uh, whatever, you know, fun's a broad word, but you're, you're out there because it's fun. And the same thing for a wolf, a wolf is gr very good at killing. Uh, they have to, they have to practice as much as they, they can. And, uh, it is kind of fun for them to run into a herd of cows, scatter them, uh, and, kind of their, this is kind of graphic, but their, uh, their strategy when they, when they do this, is they kind of come into the herd of cows and they kind of stir them all up then they'll pick one out and they'll kind of, uh, the cow is a big, strong animal. And the interesting thing about this area in particular is the wolves are always selecting the, the biggest, strongest cow almost in, in the bunch, uh, a big, strong horse. Uh, my, my rancher friends, have, have purposely, um, there's this, uh, they'll call it a leppy calf, uh, an orphan calf or a calf that has a, a sickness, um, kind of stunted, um, doesn't grow very good. You know, those cows are, are in the herd and they're the weak, weak ones of the bunch. And, you know, at the end of the summer, the ranchers hauling off all those, those weak ones never get killed. They're so, uh, good at it. They can kill the biggest, strongest cow. So they'll kind of run it, uh, 
they they can't just tackle it and bring it down so it's kind of this long drawn out process and a lot of times the cow will, will get exhausted lay down um it's cold up there in the mountains at night you know a lot of times it's freezing or below the cow goes into shock and dies the next day the rancher shows up to check his cows he sees a dead cow out here in the pasture he comes up on it and looking at it you don't see you know any any damage to it that looks like it would be a, a wolf kill um they call out the the USDA employee that I'm, I call them government trappers. Uh, we'll talk about them a little bit. The government trapper comes out. Uh, he skins the cow completely, and boom, you see all this hemorrhaging. You see the the tooth marks that can measure them and confirm that it was a wolf kill. So the ranchers are obviously infuriated by the situation because not only is their valuable animal killed, they haven't even eaten it. And so these ranchers very quickly develop an intense hatred for these for these wolves that are just coming down and just killing for fun, uh, you know, wasting the the animal. And so that's like one side of this equation is the the rancher and the producer. Rangeland Magazine you mentioned with these graphic yeah. pictures. Um, there's a lot of emotion because a lot of times, uh, say a rancher only has a couple hundred head of cows. You know, if a wolf comes in five times throughout the summer and kills five cows that affects the, the rancher's profit. You know, their profit margin is very small, especially with the cost of doing business nowadays. Like they can't afford to lose a single cow, much less multiple. Um, so it's a it's a really a big deal for them. So when I came into the situation, I could immediately see, you know, the the hot emotion that these ranchers had towards the the animal. Um, and and then they have the, uh, uh, the, the government trappers, which are kind of the stations throughout the area. Uh, throughout the state to help mitigate this loss um, and, and kind of help uh, the situation, but they're only uh, they're only human. These wolves will talk more also about how smart they are in my experiences with them, but it's no easy task to like, oh, the wolves are here killing the cows. They live here. They're here all the time. You can't just go in there and, and trap them or shoot them. Um, the forest is very dense. They are extremely smart. So the ranchers asking for all the help he can get to try to, uh, you know, put a stop to this, this killing. Um, I came into the scenario, um, at this point, uh, thermal hunting, hunting at night for, for wolves was not legal, but they had uh, depredation permits for these ranchers where if they showed loss, they could get uh, a depredation permit. They could list people on that depredation permit that would then give them permission to, uh, kill wolves on site day or night, as long as they were on the property or within a mile of the property boundary. So I came, uh, I'd been hunting coyotes for quite some time and had been, hunt, uh, hunting coyotes with thermal imagery for quite some time. And, um, you know, that's, uh, thermal is a crazy technology. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, you'd think would tip the odds heavily in your favor for coyote hunting. It allows me, um, like when I'm working, uh, a contract in, in, you know, depredation on coyotes, I'm typically always going to hunt at night because it's so much more effective, uh, with that thermal in my dogs. So I just was going to, you know, translate my, my strategy and skill there onto these wolves. What could go wrong? Yeah. And in theory, you know, I'm like, all right, these wolves are just hammering these, these cows. I'm just going to need to post up and watch. And when the wolves come down and kill the cows, I'll waltz on out there and clean them up and the rancher will love me. And this is going to be great. Uh, how how old were you when you thought this? Like uh, 26? Well, I'm 28 now, so uh, I was like, like 24, 25. Sounds like um, something a 24, 25-year-old would yeah, be like, yeah. oh, I got and this. Like, and nobody had really been, you know, the government hunters have been using thermal. But again, uh, uh, some of those guys were really good. Some of those guys, you know, weren't so good, trying their best, but just didn't, weren't experienced enough to be very effective at it. And I'd been you know, just mowing down coyotes year round. So I had a lot of confidence in these people were my friends. They had a lot of confidence in me. Um, and so I set off on that adventure and, uh, long story short, you know, I would go and, and spend the summer, uh, hunting these, these wolves. And, you know, I would have to be very consistent about hunting every single night because I could go six nights in a row all night, sun up to sundown cows are safe. I'm sitting out there and walking around calling, you know, different strategies. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back to town and see my wife and, and have a day off. Wolves come in that night and, <laughs> and, and kill a cow like clockwork. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wasn't using 
the dogs to, to aid me. Um, my, one of my very first, my first coyote dog, he's nine now. Um, you know, he's been all over with me and done all sorts of stuff. So he was there as my sidekick, um, kind of watching my back, you know, he's got his nose and that, you know, I can see with the thermal, but I can't see into the woods. And there's many occasions where, um, like again, me and this dog have hunted nights together thousands and thousands of times alone in the desert, middle of nowhere. Uh, nothing freaks him out. He's not scared of anything, but he knew what a wolf was and that they were not to be messed with. So like I'm sitting there and the wind's coming off the mountain and I'm like, all right, like the wolves can't smell me. Uh, you know, I can see the valley on my, my one side and he's sitting there next to me and all of a sudden he gets all freaked out and starts growling and pacing back and forth and looking up in, in the woods, you know, letting me know there's probably a wolf up there. One time he did that and I killed one shortly after. Um, and so it just, you know, that they, they come into a situation and they're like circling the valley and before they come in and, and make a move where a coyote is not quite so calculated and, and cautious, you know, especially at night, you know, uh, these wolves hadn't been really hunted with thermal um and they already had that they were already it's like smart to it um up in this area mccall donnelly very popular hunting area uh the lots of uh forest service ground um the wolves learned not to howl back you know you can go out in the wilderness and, and hear wolves howl pretty much anywhere in idaho you can howl to them they'll howl back uh these wolves were like silent like i never heard them howl um very small groups um on the small, on, you know, a lot of times you think of a wolf pack, you think of like six to 10 wolves, um, where wolves are heavily pressured. Uh, one of the things that is a byproduct of that, that inadvertently helps the wolves is when they get, uh, broke up into smaller packs, you know, you got instead of one big pack, keeping all the other wolves out of this mountain range. Now you have pairs, maybe a triple and their, their range kind of shortens. Um, and now you have multiple packs of wolves killing cows. Uh, or elk or whatever, um, you know, the more, the more pressure you, there's an, also an argument, like the more pressure you put on the wolves, uh, you know, the worse it's, it's going to be, um, which to some extent might be true, but you can't just not do anything. Cause again, these ranchers will go out of business. You know, you can look at, uh, uh, data on elk herds, you know, up in the, one of the most commonly shared uh, things on social media, as far as wolf info is, uh, the low, low zone up on the Idaho, Montana border used to have, you know, so many elk and now it's like a quarter or less of the, the elk population. It's a very remote area. You can't really get in there and, and hunt the wolves very effectively. Um, and so the, the elk population has suffered. So like you got to do something about it, but uh, you definitely are affecting the balance of things as you are out there doing that. Uh, but again, long story short, I spend a couple summers out there I kill five wolves, uh, four of them at night with my thermal, one of them during the day. Um, the wolf I killed during the day was probably the, the highlight of my hunting career to date. I'll tell that story real quick. Uh, you know, hunting them with the thermal, I thought it was going to be easy. It was still stupid hard. And you know, the, the wolves I got were hard earned and I've always felt like I had a little bit of luck on my side and, uh, the wolf always kind of slipped up when I was able to get one. Um, but one day after hunting all night long, uh, the sun comes up I'm overlooking this massive valley that the cows are living in. Um, I'm up on a high point and I see a little white dot out across the, the corner of the valley. I'm like, Oh, is that a wolf? Pull up my binos. The first wolf I've ever seen in the daytime. Like, Whoa, no way. Um, and this valley is, Oh, two miles, lo- two miles across and a couple miles long. It's probably a mile away from me. And I'm watching it for a second, trying to figure out, uh, you know, this is bare, uh, meadow across. So I can't just like stalk in on it. Um, it's definitely going to see me. Um, and I'm kind of watching, trying to see which way it's going. Maybe I can get ahead of it. And it's working down the center of the valley following this, this little river. And I watch it for 10 or 15 minutes. I see it, uh, come up on some sandhill cranes. It kind of stalks in on them. Like it's hungry, flushes them up. Uh, it comes up on a cow elk and the cow elk faces it down and the wolf looks at it and the cow elk kind of rushes it and the wolf kind of moves off. I'm like, okay, it's, it's definitely uh, hunting hungry. Um, I happen to have my two very best decoy dogs with me and they're experienced enough where I can point them in a direction and say, go that way. And they'll carry and, and go hundreds of yards, but I can also and beep them on my collar and know they're going to come straight back to me. So I thought, okay, the wolf is far enough away. 
you know, I can send my dogs out there and when I can see the wolf when it locks on my dog, I'm going to call my dogs back and hopefully it follows like the coyotes do. So I snuck down to the edge of the valley, got holed up in some, some sagebrush, set my dogs out, started watching the wolf with the binoculars. My dogs went about 400 yards. The wolf was maybe 800 to a thousand yards at that point. And as soon as I see it perk up on the dogs, I beep them back. They turn around and come back and the wolf starts following immediately. And it's kind of keeping pace with the dogs. And as the dogs got to, uh, like 200 yards is 400 yards. And then it starts to pick up the, the pace. My dog get to a hundred yards is a hundred yards behind him. I'm looking at it in my scope. I'm like, Oh, I could shoot it now, but it, it's still coming. This is like such a surreal moment for me. I can't even believe it's actually happening. Uh, my dogs get to me, the wolf starts running at me and I stop it at 50 yards and anchor it right there. Done. And man, I was so excited. Uh, it just, I'd, I'd thought about that scenario, if it might ever happen, being able to use my dogs to, to get a wolf like that. In order for it to happen, it would have to be the perfect scenario where it was open enough that I could keep my dogs covered. I can't send them up into the up into the woods out of sight with a wolf because they stand no chance. But in that scenario, it just uh, landed in my lap and worked out perfectly and uh, was definitely really, really cool. Um, that, was the, that was two years ago. That's the last wolf I killed. Um, it got to the point for me in that scenario where I was spending so much time, uh, you know, I, the ranchers were paying me and, and they really took good care of me and, uh, they had a beautiful ranch, great place to stay. Um, and I still go up there and spend time, but I am trying to develop my, my coyote dogs. That's something I can do year round, uh, successfully. And during that summertime as I'm wolf hunting, I'm missing out on my favorite time of year to coyote hunt. And so these past couple of years, I've kind of got back to, putting my focus on the, the coyotes and, and my dogs. Um, that's the the prime season for me. And I haven't been wolf hunting quite as much, but I did get uh, inter- being able to interact with the ranchers, see it from their perspective, being able to work alongside the government trappers and see things from, from their perspective, uh, what they deal with, and then just gain a whole respect for these wolves um, that, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to have or, or get, um, without spending all that time just getting your butt kicked by them and really learn what they really are as an animal. So now I have a perspective where I try to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, I by no means hate or have anything with utmost respect for a wolf, even if they are uh, a cold-blooded killer at times. Um, but I also understand that the management is super important and necessary. Uh, you know, if they're here, they have to be hunted. Um, a lot of people hate the reintroduction situation and the fact that we have wolves here i wouldn't have ever been able to have these amazing experiences and the best hunt of my life if there was no wolves uh and so them being here has really uh afforded that that experience for me um and so yeah i try to be somewhere in the middle of this uh this love hate relationship with them that people have man it seems first off your story about getting the wolf like I don't know if you're just a great storyteller or I'm so into this, but like my heart was beating, like lit. just yeah. imagine being. Um, and, and like, you know, at night in the thermal, you know, it's like a computer game yeah, situation. Right. Like you're like, uh, I've shot, uh, like I've come around the corner and had a wolf right there in the thermal, like looking at me a hundred yards away and, and shot it, but it wasn't nearly as, uh, just a riveting personal experience as seeing that wolf's eyes in my scope as it runs in on me and, you know, that was just a breathtaking experience that I can still just picture in my mind, like the second before the shot, it's staring at me. And, you know, when a coyote or a wolf or dog goes into kill mode, kill mode, their eyes change. And then it's like these yellow fiery eyes and little pupils. And that's all I can see in my scope. And yeah, it was just a, a wild experience. God, man, I'm getting fired up. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to, I don't know how to deal with this. Um, it, it seems like one of the situations that's just so impossible to untangle because you have you have problems, very real problems with ranchers, and then you have that 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 is affecting uh, not just one family but the entire. I mean, like we love beef, right? Mm-hmm. Like we love domesticated livestock, and this is something that deeply affects and negatively mm-hmm. those types of things. It just makes life harder for those people. But yeah. you also have there's a gentleman I spoke with recently who feels the wolves are actually worse on 
wild game and 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 big game than they are on livestock. He he raised his family off, you know, elk and moose and and hunting very much as an independent self-determined individual. Yep. And he feels very strongly that introducing wolves back into this area advertently or inadvertently increased reliance on farming uh, farmed meat on uh, you know government on and again I'm, i have a very hard time seeing and hearing his perspective and not agreeing with it. it's like look if you if you for the last 20 years got your protein and like went out intentionally and did this thing and and you know you had no problem climbing mountains and you know riding riding horses having pack goats alpacas whatever you want like doing all of these things so you can provide for your family in this way and then reintroducing this this animal into the area and letting it uh proliferate to the point where you no longer have the capacity to do that he's like what do I go to Fred Myers? Yeah. Like I got to go get a steak. It's, and now like I've been eating this like superhuman wild game, right? Yeah. Like what am I doing? Like I don't want to go to In-N-Out. Yeah. No it's, no uh, no stab at In-N-Out. Fi- fishing but. game was uh you know very influential and in, and in pushed the the reintroduction. Um and then they uh controlled the management of them up until very recently. Um fish, come, come, fishing, come back to the mic here. You you got a little sorry. far. Fish, away. Fishing game views are elk and deer ho- elk and deer herds as a major resource uh fishing game brings in more money to the state than any other organ than any other government organization um so the deer and elk are valuable to them um and they're I technically wish, our they're i wish technically i our wish resources. that they i wish that they viewed them as our resource uh is the the public's um you know in in geared the management a little bit more towards the the benefit of the public rather than uh, money into the state. For example, uh, Idaho is one of the only states, if not the only Western state, that just allows over-the-counter non-residents. Uh, because of that, we get just an insane influx of non-residents to, to hunt. And deer season in Idaho lately is disgusting. <laughs> and, uh, and I could go on and on about that. Um, what do you but, well, like? Just, just don't, so, don't just go on and on, but on, go on a little bit. Unreal amount of people. When I'm like, just when you have such a growing population as we have here locally, and then you add in just as many non-residents, you know, the mountains are a big place, but it is amazing how many people are out there filling it up. And it is just a zoo out there. Idaho has different game management units, and some units are limited entry, uh, a lottery system to draw a tag to get out there. Those are capped and you're only going to have so many hunters out there, but then they have a lot of other units, uh, mainly the, a lot of the units close to town here where it's general for, uh, residents and non-residents. And so they all concentrate into these areas. And so the the control unit, you know, it's going to be pretty chill over there, but unit 39 right here, the Iwahis to the south of us, it is, uh, I feel like if, if someone was going to ask me, how can we change the hunting for the better here in Idaho? I would say easy. Make it short range weapon only. Uh, short range weapon can be a shotgun with a slug, a bow and arrow, a muzzle loader. Nowadays, those muzzle loaders are capable of shooting 200 yards easy, which is a pretty long distance. But when you have uh, ATVs, razors, and long range rifles, um, people can access every nook and cranny of the mountains and they can take pot shots at the animals on the mountainside across the way. So the animals just get all this pressure from people running their off-road vehicles, shooting, and the animals have a bad time and they're just, you know, just herded around and they don't have any spot to relax and, and be safe. Um, and the, the people, it's just not, uh, hunting to me when you're on your, like, Every, like you said earlier, everyone needs deserves to eat deer. Like you should be able to go get your deer elk for the year, have your meat for the the year. Like you need to be able to do that. But uh, just to be able to crawl all over the the mountain and people that have you know a long range shooting has become very popular. People aren't capable like they think they are. So there's a lot of uh, wounded animals and just horror stories. Um, I think that it really could be reined in. So well, the and, wolves and, get a lot of blame yeah. uh, on 
you know, hurting the game population, but people do a lot of damage themselves. So I think fishing game, but basically I got off on this tangent because no, I think good. that fishing game really values the, the animals, you know, they're not trying to introduce wolves to wipe out the game populations. Um, you know, uh, I, but I do think that they, they don't have the, the mindset of managing them, of managing the animals for the people, um, and managing the animals for the betterment of the animals. Um, they are making millions and millions and millions of dollars just on tag sales alone because they do allow this, this kind of free for all. Um, I think that there's plenty of ways to give everyone hunting opportunity without making it a, a madhouse out there. And it's just every year getting kind of worse and worse. And I feel like it has to come to a head at some point. There's talk of changing the access for non-residents, making all non-residents have to draw to, to hunt, which I think is long overdue. Um, but they're definitely, uh, it's, it's not just wolves fault that, uh, game, game herds are, are struggling. Um, there's definitely got to be some, some middle ground found there. You can't just blame one thing. There's a lot of different factors from people and predators and disease and, uh, you know, ranchers, uh, having to, to change their practices to, in ways that don't benefit the, the wildlife as much, uh, because of their struggles. Um, there's a lot of different factors to it. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think that the elk and deer are valuable. Um, but the, the wolves undoubtedly do have an effect on it all. Sure. Sure. And uh, uh, again, I'm a transplant. I have no, I have no hesitation saying that. Um, I, and I don't have any, I don't have any, uh, ill will towards people. <laughs> no animosity. Here. Yeah. My, my family. Well, thank God. Cause you're sitting in my studio. I <laughs> uh, Idaho is such a great place. I've been all around the country. I can't blame anybody for wanting to move here. This is the greatest spot That's in great. the country. It's great. And I think, it, uh, again, I think Idaho pays a large price from all the uh, other areas. Like you look at law enforcement, there's a, I think the law enforcement in this area predominantly has a very, very good relationship with the community. Um, and obviously you're always going to have bad apples, but overwhelmingly I have not seen like the war on police that, that you hear about. Mm. And I've witnessed in other States, mm. um, from an education standpoint, I think like the education system isn't perfect. We have a, a wonderful, robust, uh, homeschool, uh, community here. But I think the, I think the school districts in Idaho that I know about comparatively are, are, comparatively yeah. are really trying. They are really trying to reduce, you know, keep out nonsense, all, all these kind of things. So focus in on one task and that's mm -hmm. very clear education. The three R's reading, writing, arithmetic, right? So you have law enforcement, you have, um, you have education being affected because of the reputation of out of state school districts. You have law enforcement being affected by out of state turmoil with law enforcement. You have politics being grossly affected by out of state politics. Right. Like there's a large portion of people who are very easily persuaded, um, at least to some degree, by politicians saying, I will keep this place, not that place. Right. I vote for me because I don't want it to become Washington. I don't want it to become California. And again, that's out of state politics. You're just using the reference point of like the train wreck that California is as a as a rally so cry. Funny, yeah, yeah, to sell your it was like, what are you gonna do? Like, forget that, right? Well, can you tell me something else you're gonna do? Because I think everyone in the entire state wants people in California don't want California to be California. <laughs> yeah. Like they they don't even yeah. like it. Right. There I have uh, I have friends that yeah. I speak with all the time. They're like, I'm ready to move up, right? And they and they are good. Like God fearing, family oriented, hardworking people. One one with six kids. I was talking to him just the other day. He's a good man, and he's like, I'm at I'm at the end. Like I can't keep doing this. And he's he was actually talking about coming up soon to you know. There's some industry up here that he that he's familiar with. But the point is, fish and game similar, right? E even if you want to look at it from the standpoint of California has made. Uh, I was speaking with somebody that was involved in a California fishing game decades ago. And they're like, they didn't view it that like their emphasis was on preserving every single animal that California had. They had no interest in developing a robust, successful, um, uh, participating, um, hunting community that would then further, uh, further fund conservation mm -hmm. efforts and things like this, which is a big piece of it. It's like, go out and buy a hunting and fishing license. I had, uh, this guy, great guy, Burke Mantell. On. And he said, look, if you like, even if you're not a hunter or a fisherman, if you like 
the animals that you see, if you like seeing fish in the in the lakes and the rivers, go out and buy a hunting and fi- these licenses because then you will be funding these things and you get double the money because the Pittman Robertson Act and the Dingle Johnson Act both oh, yeah. double the money, right? So he's like, go out and buy the hundred, yeah. whatever the cost Nothing is. Nothing helps wildlife more than that. Right. And so instead of recognizing that it's like, hey, if we get a popu- a healthy population of educated participating hunters here, we could use those that revenue as a source to further conserve conserve like the uh, the longhorn sheep, right? Like you, it's the the guy who wins that lottery here who's you know, I've been told regularly pays between a quarter million and five hundred thousand dollars just for the mm-hmm. one tag yep. right for that sheep. and that goes to, at least attempt to help. Whether or not yep. people want to make arguments, whether it's successful or not, irrelevant yep. to me. But the point is, that's a really, really important way of viewing this, which is participation from all people. Don't just shut down an interest, uh, industry in the name of conserving these animals, because you actually probably could have done more to conserve the animals if you had just yep. developed cooperation, like develop a community of people that want to hunt. So those people then flood into here, like we're saying, out of state decisions, out of state policies, then start affecting this state. And it's yeah. it's blowing my mind as I delve deeply into these different swaths of Idaho that I now call home and I deeply love and realizing like, oh my God, it's the rest of the country that is affecting this state mm-hmm. in unbelievable ways. Yeah. Like you you couldn't even, you got to dig deep to see it all. Yeah, there's been some news articles popping up down in Colorado. They just uh, revamped their commissioner board of, of, of their fish and game and uh, wildlife, all that. They ended up appointing some animal rights activists onto the board. This is going to so be those, great. Yeah, those people are going to push back on, on hunting, but... Uh, like you just said, there's there's no better way to raise money than like here in Idaho, we're talking about reintroducing grizzly bears. If right off the bat, we say we're going to reintroduce grizzly bears, but we're going to have five tags available every year. One of them is going to be auctioned. One of them is going to be, uh, or four of them are going to be available to the general public. Right. And the auction tag will bring half a million dollars that we can either put towards grizzly bears. Maybe we, you make a fund and say, okay, this, this money will go towards reimbursing ranchers or, or people right. out in those rural communities that are affected by the bears, uh, you know, and make it so those people don't want to necessarily kill the bear. They're more willing to live in harmony because they can get some compensation for right. the effects. Um, you know, there can definitely be a, a lot of good come from that, but by, Introducing something, not allowing hunting, you know, you can't, I don't care, PETA and the Humane Society of the United States cannot raise enough money uh, to do much good. And those organizations, you know, they raise the money, but you don't see the money going towards the communities, the animals, uh, any of that. Well, uh, my uh, corruption. My step-grandfather, uh, so my dad's wife, um, his, or excuse me, her father was a game born in Montana his whole mm-hmm. life, his entire career. And... I guarantee you somebody who's like from PETA or whatever organization that believes we need to stop hunting has definitely not driven along with those. So she would tell me like my dad, you know, her dad, my step grandfather would drive, drive through Montana going to do whatever. And he's like, I saw 200 deer emaciated and too weak to hop over these, these yeah. fences and they would get stuck on the fence. So it's like their hindquarters. Yeah, they're they're like, and they would say hundreds, hundreds yeah. and hundreds of them because they weren't hunting them successfully. There wasn't yeah. enough food for all of them. They got weakened and then just died this miserable death yeah. on a fence, yeah. you know, and even the concept of hunting being brutal. It's like, let me ask you something. How do you think a deer dies in the wild? Like, yeah. uh, like, I'm just curious, like, do you think it just lies down in a green pasture at the ripe age of like 50 and it's like, oh, I've had a good life. Yeah. Like the, it's like, it's going to be ripped to shreds no, no... by something. Yeah. The lucky deer that gets shot and dies, that's the best death that a wild animal can, can ever think of. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the age old arguments for, for hunting. And, you know, again, why I said, uh, it's big paints hunting in such a much better light when everyone's trying to be ethical and can say, you know, this, this is, uh, not the worst thing that's going to 
happened to to this deer try being hamstrung yeah <laughs> right try having the webbing under your front yeah. front legs torn out yeah. so you're like just need to follow, out bow follow that instagram page nature's metal for a little bit oh and you will God. get you will get a good idea of of all the things my there. one of my favorite uh nature videos of all time is off nature's metal and it's uh i think it's a lynx chasing down this it was like a goat or something they're way up in these rocky mountains and this you see it going, going in this, uh, the, the goat is like hauling ass and it would it really good video. Cause you could even hear like hooves mm -hmm. on rock. So it must've been across the valley. Somebody's videotaping and it's yeah. echoing out and you see right at this last minute, the lynx clamps onto the hind quarters and they go over oh, a cliff. cliff. There's a snow leopard. There you go. Yes. And this fucking guy, and, uh, do, do, they fall free fall. Go boom! You hear him crash. Does not let go. Just go boom, boom. I played this back when I was doing SAT tutoring. I played it for every single one of my students because I was like, "Do you recognize how damn savage this animal has to be? It could die yeah. right now, and it is not. And like as you see it, you see the tail tumbling from mm -hmm. the snow leopard, not letting go, and finally it comes yeah. to a stop. And you see it like start to get up. It's like, do That's you how understand? Hard survival is right. out there because you, you know you have to kill to eat this is the, you gotta fall off the cliff you're gonna starve to death or you can fall off the cliff and eat and right it's and it's like and out. here you're studying math and and grammar rules mm -hmm. and like this is how hard you could be like yep. human beings used to be this hard. like the clovis people there was actually this uh this wonderful um interview that i was listening to that was recalling um clovis kill sites and they're like listen this is how it went like these people were fucking savages and they they had come upon um it was like mastodons or woolly mammoths or something i'm i'm gonna screw it up but there's like the the kill site itself was there was a herd of like uh, i think 11 animals so you had a bull you had the cow and then you had nine nine of their children and it's like the the kill site was wild because you had all nine of the kids all the skeletons mm -hmm. the the bull elk took off early on and they, he was found like five miles away with something like four arrows there four four heads in it because yeah. they were using adelacts yeah. right like yeah, or, yeah. i think that's what it is anyway the point is each of the kids had like one arrowhead in it but the mom the cow had like nine because this <laughs> fucking animal <laughs> yeah and like we're talking multi-ton gi giant against these mm -hmm. little humans who were like breaking femurs they were like these midgets with these yeah. things just going yeah. going so and like that's how it's hard how you survive. had to yeah. be yeah. like you're gonna go you're gonna off this cliff death, or you're, you're gonna, gonna go off this, this cliff <laughs> or you're gonna starve to death and that's that's how hard we had yeah. to be back then and it's yeah. such a beautiful thing to think about that like you have that and that but that disconnect uh i wanted to touch on this leads perfectly into it you know people think okay if we make uh bear hunting and it's very interesting to me you'd think that people would push to save the deer or the elk the sweet little deer and the elk but like no save the mountain lion the wolf and the bear so in california that's what has been uh illegalized in, in oregon you can't hunt cougars with dogs anymore same with washington but what people don't realize is that okay you stop uh hunting these predators the predator population increases in california these lions are now being are now inbreeding and the in the population is weakening because they don't have a uh, genetic diversity from you know killing an animal and another one being able to to move in um but the the fact of the matter is is that if you illegalize hunting for predators the hunting doesn't stop it just isn't done by the public anymore the usda the state has for every state in the country has government trappers and they their job is to go and you know get the lion comes in the neighborhood kills the person's dog and say hey dude you got to come down here uh, take your dogs, go catch this mountain lion and, and put it down because it's going to come back and kill a kid next. So you have guys with, with dogs and their horseback and they are hunting every day in Oregon and in California, uh, you know, hunting and, and hunting to kill these, these animals. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, if you legalize hound hunting, so here in Idaho, uh, a, a passionate hound hunter, the, some of the best hound hunters I know have never killed a mountain lion. They catch 20 a year, but they're like, no, I don't, I don't want to kill one. If I kill it, I can't run it. Uh, he lives in this canyon. I'll come back next year, catch her again. Uh, you know, they're very conservative with the animals. Uh, just like I explained with my dogs, you know, they're like, oh, using dogs for hunting. That's, that's, uh, unethical. It's cheating. It's so hard to, to be successful. Uh, you know, a, a guy who has a pack of, of hounds that are good at catching bears and mountain lions, like he's been doing it his whole life. And he, just like me, he's breeding these dogs specifically for this task. It's very difficult to maintain 
that edge and be successful at it. So you remove that from the the situation that that hound hunter, there's still a hound hunter out there, but he is being paid and he has to go kill every single thing that he catches because everything he's on is uh, is a problem. Um, and now the taxpayer is paying for that money. So instead of the hound hunter coming in and paying for his hunting license, his houndsman license, and feeding back into the system, now the taxpayer is paying all the gas and dog food and the salary of this guy to go and do what they fought so hard to make illegal. So that's all that, you know, you, you illegalize predator hunting. You just make it illegal for the, the common man who's going to pay into the system and and help fund conservation. And now you've created an expense that is every day running because it's one guy who's trying to cover all this area and make up for the lack of, of pressure. And you still have the lion's, you know, he can't be everywhere at once. So these, these coyotes in California, the lions, they have no fear of people. They'll walk through the backyard. They're a danger to children. Whereas in Idaho, you never see a, a you know, there's some, the, the coyotes in the foothills will kind of come in on people's dogs sometimes. And, uh, you'll see, you'll see a little bit there. Uh, but we don't have many bear attacks. We have, you know, lion attacks are rare because they have this fear of humans that, you know, they're being pressured, they're being pursued and they don't have this brazen indifference due to the lack of pressure. How do we how do we fix this? Seth? Is there, is just, there any just, way out? It is. I feel like the only way is just educating people. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't have an open mind, so it's hard to talk to somebody who's not willing to listen listen to reason. But when you know it, your your biases are funded or based only on uh, emotion um, and not not facts, not asking other people for for their perspective. Um, you know, again, I try to have to to be somewhere in the middle. You know, people. Uh, someone who doesn't hunt deserves to be able to go up to the mountains and hike to the mountain lake and hear wolves howl in the distance. And, you know, they don't live there. They don't deal with the wolves, but they got to, you know, hearing a wolf howl in the, in the wild, that's a hell of an experience and everyone should be able to have that. So, you know, you got to respect both sides, but that person should also understand that those wolves are serious business. And if they're there, they're going to get hunted. You can either opt for, the hunter out here buying his tag and his, li- and his license and hiking his butt off to the mountain, freezing his butt off and, and maybe killing one, or you can pay the uh, fishing game, in the helicopter, and they're going to go up and they're going to whole pack gone. And, you know, more wolves will move in, you know, they're not going to exterminate them, but you know, because those wolves weren't getting pressured, they had to be exterminated. They, they, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this. So, the uh, maybe i did before the podcast uh they just introduced wolves to colorado mm. they they trapped wolves in uh oregon collared them brought them to colorado and no hunting for wolves allowed but wolves don't know boundaries and they have huge home ranges so the wolf went up to wyoming and got shot and that wolf would have lived he never would have been shot in oregon he would have lived to, to old age but these people had to come and trap him and bring him over somewhere he didn't know and uh, he ended up getting shot. So that didn't work out very good for the wolf. You know, we had all these cool pictures and it was super awesome to, to reintroduce wolves, but in the end reality hits and it's never what people hope. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and just messing around with the, uh, willfully messing around with the, the, I don't know, as, as much as people criticize humans and, and what we do, like we eventually find balances one way or another. Yeah. You know, and I mean, if we're, point... if we're smart enough to breed these, these specific dogs for a job and we have, and we can do that, like we can find some balance in, in nature, right. you know, people are going to continue to move. There's more houses going to be built. Landowners are going to change hands. You know, things are always going to, to change, but I do think that we can find the balance, but people have to be open-minded and willing to to see the whole picture to, to find that you know you can't be the rancher and say i'm not we got to kill them all like uh you know yeah. make legalize legalize poisoning and, and wipe them out you know that's that's good for the rancher but it's not good for everyone else some people like me want to hunt them some people want to hear them like they they're they're here to stay uh but we all have to find some some common ground so, you know they in now they're going to talk about i'm sure they're going to bring grizzlies in here because once they start talking about it they it's not like oh we're looking for a public comment on bringing grizzlies in here well we already have grizzlies in idaho uh just like we already had wolves before they were introduced just like colorado had wolves before they were introduced uh you know you guys are, are going to do it but let's try to do it the right way that's going to work out for everybody god bless you sir
listen, I've had you a long time. You got a baby at home. You got to get to, um, anything you want to say in closing? No, that was awesome. God, I love talking to you, Seth. You too, We're going to hit this again. Thanks, bud. Thanks, dude. MTU Studios is the proud producer for the Ada County Sheriff Podcast, the Idaho Wildlife Federation Podcast, the State Representative Ted Hill Podcast, the Idaho State PTA Podcast, and many more. If you or your organization is thinking about starting a podcast, MTU Studios would love to help. Just check out mtustudios.com.